Welcome to The Christian Atheist, where faith and reason fuse in the Incarnation. Episode number 123, Chesterton's Outline of History, Conclusion of the Everlasting Man. I have only this week finished reading G.K. Chesterton's The Everlasting Man for Our Simple Gifts podcast. As I read his final chapter, The Conclusion, I came to my own conclusion. Everyone should read and understand this conclusion before reading this book. C.S. Lewis says that in 1926 he, quote, read Chesterton's Everlasting Man and for the first time saw the whole Christian outline of history set out in a form that seemed to me to make sense. Three years later, he converted to theism, saying later in Surprise by Joy that the book was also instrumental in his turn to Christianity. In my journey back to Christ, in many ways, I too reconstructed an outline. An outline of the appearance of rationality through the lens of philosophy. An outline that seemed to contradict many of the things taken for common knowledge in the educational regime I endured, as well as the popular culture in which I grew up. The question for me always became, does this ring true? And increasingly it was the case that much of what I saw being taught, believed, and acted upon in our contemporary world, did not. The problem is one of complexity, as Chesterton points out. The story of our rationalistic age is incredibly well worked out, detailed, and complex, and we believe it so thoroughly that unless we are willing to compare an alternative vision at a much more basic level of resolution, we are likely to miss the discrepancies between the view we've been taught to believe and our lived reality. This is the dilemma of hyper-rationalization. The story that we've woven has become so compelling that it blinds us to actual experience. We don't have to individually force reality into a particular rational box, because it has already been done for us by the collective power of our cultural imagination. We believe it because everyone around us assumes it. We see the theory playing out all around us, not the reality. It is a form of mass delusion. We rest in the complexity that has sewn up all the discrepancies and resolved the mysteries in its narrative structure. We live in the age of science. We understand the world, and thus we no longer question the rationalization, because it is too overwhelmingly complex to unravel. We no longer even see it as a rationalization, but simply as reality itself. If we simplify the outline, however, draw the lines in proportion and as true to reality as we can make them, suddenly the mystery emerges again. And what has been explained away by the obscurity of complexity emerges sharply delineated, fresh, and unexplained, simple like a fact. This is the value of Chesterton's great book, and I would like to try my hand at sketching that outline as usefully as I can for our listeners. And now to Chesterton. I do not believe that the past is most truly pictured as a thing in which humanity merely fades away into nature, or civilization merely fades away into barbarism, or religion fades away into mythology, or our own religion fades away into the religions of the world. In short, I do not believe that the best way to produce an outline of history is to rub out the lines. One of the manic modern intellectual fads is scientific reductionism, what Chesterton here calls rubbing out the lines.
turning distinct realities into mere variations on a theme, so that everything is reducible to that theme, what Lewis calls the myth of evolution. If you see here the Hegelian process metaphysics at work, you are seeing properly. History, then, instead of being a series of actualities, of real events, becomes a progress, a continuum in which the later is always a more advanced and higher form of the earlier. This picture, however true it may be metaphysically, is a falsification of human experience and of common sense, for we see things and experience events. What Chesterton is urging us to do, then, is to be human beings again, to experience history in terms of that raw experience that rationality encounters prior to explaining it away, to return to an agnosticism, a real skepticism that first sees what must be explained before it is explained. He wants us to see the monster as monstrous before we classify its phylum and genus and tell its natural history as the latest manifestation of the primitive protozoa that emerged from the cosmic soup. He wants us to run in terror of our lives, to experience again the raw engagement of human beings with a real world, and not with an intellectual map. Because maps, however accurate in one dimension, always distort the reality being mapped. The Rocky Mountains on a map is one thing, but when you stand at their base and see them, really see them, or climb them, or encounter them as an obstacle in your path to the ocean, they take your breath away in every possible meaning of that phrase. The map will never do this. When we look at human history with these fresh eyes, as human beings have throughout history viewed it, as they lived it, we do not see a continuum of undifferentiated sameness, rubbed out lines. We see things drawn with bright colors and clear borders, huge alpine peaks and deep valleys, towering figures and stark contrasts in bold lines. In this conclusion, then, Chesterton presents what he calls the short story of mankind in these bold, simplified strokes. The two most startling facts to be explained in human history are humanity itself and the man, Jesus Christ. Both stand out against their respective backgrounds like lightning against a darkened sky. Humanity first, for obvious reasons. The backdrop against which we must view man is nature. And when we do so, we see, quote, a race that is, in its relation to the others, a race of gods. Man does not blend into nature. He protrudes from it. And even the most atheistic and evolutionary activists on the left today will show you in their actions, if not in their rhetoric, their concession on this point. For humanity is the origin and sole source from that which artifice emerges. There is nothing artificial without man. Those who think man a blight on nature must consider man as, in some sense, outside nature. Whatever they think, whatever they say, they certainly treat him as such. If there is anything unnatural, as in global warming, or vast urban landscapes, or rovers on Mars, 
It has not come from nature, but from man. All human history acknowledges this evident fact, and even its fashionable denial today is belied by the fact that it is only human beings who can deny it. For denial is a peculiarly human possibility, a function of that one race of gods amongst all the rest of the other beings in the natural world. Indeed, there is neither nature nor world in nature. For nature is a concept of man about the background upon which he stands. And the world is a concept that rationality uses to tie together an invisible whole from a few connected parts of experience with a spatio-temporal imagination of other parts outside our experience, or even possible experience, that which exists without being experienced. In short, man on any rational understanding transcends nature. As Chesterton says, the very sense that he is united with all things is enough to sunder him from all. End quote. For even seeing oneself as a natural object, as a part of nature, is to recognize that we stand a part. And even man's view of nature marks out his uniqueness, for what he sees in nature mirrors what he finds in himself. Quote, he sees a green architecture that builds itself without visible hands, but which builds itself into a very exact plan or pattern. Like a design already drawn in the air by an invisible finger. End quote. He sees in the world around him, on the very natural backdrop where his own existence plays out, a rational plan being executed. Each acorn grows into an oak, not a maple. Fish propagate fish, and birds, birds. That is, nature itself suggests to our rational comprehension an impression of design. Quote, this impression, whether or no it be an illusion, has so profoundly influenced this race of thinkers and masters of the material world that the vast majority have been moved to take a certain view of that world. They have concluded, rightly or wrongly, that the world had a plan, as the tree seemed to have a plan. Again, we must remind ourselves that we are presenting history and not theology. We are not concerned here to justify the truth of any of these rationally intuitive leaps of imagination. We are simply viewing the evidence itself at the basic level of experienced reality. The impression may be wrong. But that the impression exists is undeniable. The vast majority of human beings saw this plan in their world, leading to another nearly universal rational indication. Quote, The admission of this idea of a plan brought with it another thought. There was someone else, some strange and unseen being, who had designed these things. A mysterious benefactor. Design implies a designer. This rational conclusion lies at the basis of religious history. But these simple conclusions, like all rational imaginations, ramify and become more complex. Quote, now this idea of a mind that gives a meaning to the universe has received more and more confirmation within the minds of men by meditations 
and experiences much more subtle and searching than any such argument about the external plan of the world. And it is enough to say here that most men, including the wisest men, have come to the conclusion that the world has such a final purpose, and therefore such a first cause. Two different ways of treating this fundamental idea came into existence mythology, and philosophy. The majority of human beings began to tell imaginative tales about their world, its origins, and that something rather marvelous behind the cosmic curtain, leading, as such ignorance always does, to imaginative stories, hints, and suggestions. What Chesterton calls gossip and traveler's tales giving, quote, evidence of the eternal interest of the theme. They are not evidence of anything else, and they are not meant to be. They are mythology, or the poetry that is not bound in books, or bound in any other way, end quote. Like a conspiracy theorist, when the causes are hidden, we speculate, often wildly, and in doing so mix truth and fancy to amuse and console ourselves. The second approach takes the idea much more seriously. These are the select few, the minority of human beings, the sages or philosophers. They set themselves the task of directly unveiling this rational planner, behind the veil that nearly all men assumed. They devised many theories. Some sages abstracted the planner to a mere impersonal force. Some, a very few indeed, denied the existence of the rational planner altogether. And some few others denied the benevolence of the plan and the planner. Quote, But most of these theorists were theists. And they not only saw a moral plan in nature, but they generally laid down a moral plan for humanity. End quote. It is worth pointing out here that all of this, the human history we are exploring, sets man apart from all the rest of the natural world. Even the most advanced primate does not speculate on the origins of this world seek the cause of, or even see, the plan in the world about him, postulate a solar system, a universe. Only man is the artificer of such speculations. Only man seeks the reality behind the appearances, or even dreams of dreaming of it. Man does not fade away into nature. Not in any human experience. Not in any human history. We conclude, then, this week, with a history that reveals humanity united in its experience of a rational indication, call it a belief, if you will, that there is something more that lies behind this world. But divided on its approach to that presence. We will conclude this short story of mankind next time. I am a Christian with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me from wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can have your religious cake and eat it too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be a Christian.